कोई आसान काम नहीं है लेकिन डॉक्टर कुरियन ने कम से कम आर्थिक लोकतंत्र की दिशा में एक बड़ा कदम उठाने का रास्ता दिखाया दोस्तों मैं अपनी बात यहाँ समाप्त करता हूँ शायद आपको लगेगा कि मैंने आर्थिक वृद्धि और सामाजिक विकास की बात कम किया है लेकिन इस विषय पर डॉक्टर कुरियन का काम डॉक्टर कुरियन का सोच और डॉक्टर कुरियन का जीवन काफ़ी प्रकाश डालते हैं आर्थिक वृद्धि और सामाजिक विकास में बहुत फर्क है आर्थिक वृद्धि का मतलब यह है कि वस्तुओं का उत्पादन और वस्तुओं की खपत बढ़ रहा है सामाजिक विकास का मतलब यह है कि आम लोगों के जीवन में सुधार लाया जा रहा है और जीवन की गुणवत्ता बढ़ रही है सामाजिक विकास का दूसरा नाम है आज़ादी भूख से आज़ादी गरीबी और बीमारी से आज़ादी असुरक्षा से आज़ादी शोषण से आज़ादी भेदभाव से आज़ादी और हिंसा से भी आज़ादी विकास एक उद्देश्य है आर्थिक वृद्धि एक माध्यम है आर्थिक वृद्धि जरूर मदद कर सकती है क्योंकि आर्थिक वृद्धि से व्यक्तिगत आय बढ़ती है और सरकारी रेवेन्यू भी बढ़ता है जिससे सार्वजनिक सुविधाएं उपलब्ध कराई जा सकती है लेकिन विकास सिर्फ आर्थिक वृद्धि की बात नहीं है सामाजिक विकास के लिए न केवल आर्थिक वृद्धि की जरूरत है लेकिन इस तरह का सामाजिक परिवर्तन सामूहिक पहल सार्वजनिक कार्रवाई और सहकारी संस्थाओं की जरूरत है जिनकी शक्ति डॉक्टर कुरियन ने दिखाया नाम स्विटिंग स्विचिंग टू इंग्लिश सो इन दिस ब्रीफ ऑरेशन आई हैव ट्राई टू ड्रॉ अटेंशन टू थ्री इंस्पायरिंग एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ डॉक्टर कुरियन लाइफ एंड वर्क दैट अपियर टू मी टू बी वेरी रेलिवेंट टू झारखंड Incidentally, I met Dr. Ye Dr. Korean once very briefly, and we had a short conversation that uh, was characteristic of his practical mindset. Uh, because he was at that time still in NDDB, I asked him what he thought about the idea of providing uh, milk in midday meals. I was interested at that time in midday meals in uh, schools, so I asked him how. Uh, it would be if a glass of milk was given to children every day in the, with a midday meal, and he immediately said it was a bad idea because milk is perishable, so it will, there will be a lot of safety issues. And he said a much better idea will be to give them peanuts. Very practical suggestion, characteristic of him. Uh, later on, this idea of giving milk was largely abandoned, uh, and instead of that, we promoted not peanuts but eggs. And uh, the good news is that today many states in India are providing eggs in midday meals, which is a very big step forward for child nutrition because eggs are very nutritious. It's a kind of ideal food for growing children. It's also safe. Uh, it's affordable, and of course, children love to eat eggs. Uh, so this is a real step forward. But I remember that conversation very well. and in particular the speed with which he reacted to the suggestion and presented a better suggestion instead um so the first point i was making was that dr kurian is a rare example of a people scientist a first rate scientist and manager who applied his talents and skills to an everyday problem of ordinary people namely the marketing of milk and milk products of course later on a mul cooperative became much more than a marketing cooperative but that is at least where things started and as i said he was initially reluctant to work in the dairy sector but once he joined it he gave it his heart and soul and this enabled him to change the lives of millions of poor people and i started with that observation because it seems to me that india needs many more people scientists and people technicians like dr kurian who take interest in everyday technology and people's basic needs and not just in sophisticated technology like biometrics or artificial intelligence uh, the consequence of neglecting everyday technology is a remarkable stagnation uh, of the technology of everyday life and correspondingly the existence of a whole range of occupations that may be described as 
stagnant occupations because they are more or less the same as they used to be decades ago. And as I said, the entire rural sector, or at least agriculture, agricultural sector in Jharkhand, uh, looks to me like a kind of stagnant occupation in spite of the fact that there are so many local resources that could be used to improve people's livelihoods and well-being without causing the sort of environmental destruction that we are witnessing today. But for this, we need many more Dr. Koreans. Uh, the second point I made was the fact that Dr. Korean symbolizes the critical importance of the non-profit sector in development and in society. Dr. Korean did not act out of greed for money. He acted out of passion and public spiritedness. Similarly, he did not manage Amul Cooperative as a profit maximizing enterprise. The chief objective of Amul was not profit, but the welfare of its members, the Indian farmers. This is a prime example of the usefulness of non-profit activity in large parts of the economy and society. In economics, there is a strange notion that profit-seeking is what drives the economy and that profit-seeking is generally compatible with and even conducive to social welfare. I think that idea is very misleading and indeed it flies in the face of ec economic theory itself. I have illustrated that point with reference to health, one of the foundations of human well-being. It is well understood in economics that profit-seeking is often counterproductive in the field of health. I have given some reasons for that, but there are many others. For example, the fact that when it comes to health, people are often not very clear about their own best interest. Or they may be clear about their interest, but they may not be able to act on it. For example, you, you may know that you have to brush your teeth every day, but you may feel that, you know, chalo kal karenge, pason karenge, and you can procrastinate like that and find yourself one year later with rotten teeth. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that we know are good for health, but we don't do them either out of ignorance or out of lack of will. And that is one important reason uh, for some sort of public intervention or public action like compulsory uh, vaccination camps, banning certain products like junk food and cigarettes that are addictive and ruin people's health and so on and so forth. Another reason is what is called externalities in economics, the fact that one person's health tends to affect other people's health as well, and for, especially, for example, in the context of communicable diseases, and that again calls some, for some kind of public intervention as opposed to relying on the market. So all this is relatively well understood in the field of healthcare, but it applies in many other fields as well to varying extents. And that is why non-profit institutions, institutions uh, including the public sector, as well as the private non-profit sector, plays a critical role in development, in health, in education, in the dispensation of justice, in the protection of the environment, and in all kinds of other activities that contribute to the quality of life. And the third source of, of inspiration I mentioned uh, is Dr. Curian's commitment to cooperation as a mode of economic organization and social interaction. At the risk of simplification, we can say that there are three principal modes of social interaction. Competition, coercion, and cooperation. It's a bit of a simplification, but for today's purposes, it will do. The problem with, with competition is that it tends to create inequality. And the problem with coercion is that it tends to violate individual freedom. Cooperation can help to reconcile, or rather voluntary cooperation. Voluntary cooperation can help to reconcile freedom and equality. This point was well expressed by Dr. Ambedkar 
in his historic speech to the Constituent Assembly on 25th of November 1949, when he spoke about the importance of fraternity, which can be thought of as an ideal form of cooperation. He said, without equality, liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over the many. Without equality, without liberty, would kill individual initiative. Without fraternity, liberty and equality could not become a natural cause of things. Cooperation is important and has great potential, not only as a form of social interaction, but even as a mode of economic organization. If you look at the average small-scale enterprise in India, there is no obvious reason why it should not be managed by the workers on the basis of mutual cooperation rather than through top-down relationships like the wage labor system. The main reason why there is a boss quite often is not that he or she is needed to coordinate the work or to bear the risks of the enterprise, but simply that the boss has the power to call the shots. If we value freedom and equality, then cooperation, or rather voluntary cooperation, seems like a much better approach. The main economic systems of the 20th century, capitalism and communism, have built mainly on competition and coercion, respectively. The results have been very unsatisfactory in both cases. My hope is that the 21st century will be the century of cooperation in economic and social life with much better results. Of course, competition and coercion cannot easily be avoided entirely, but their domain can be restrained and the domain of cooperation can be expanded. The scope for cooperation, of course, depends on our ability to cultivate a spirit of solidarity beyond narrow circles such as the family or caste. That may seem like wishful thinking, but it is even more naive, I think, to think that humanity can survive much longer unless we develop more enlightened and socially rational value systems. All this has an important bearing on the initial theme of this oration, economic growth and social development. I say initial theme because I deviated for, from it quite a bit after reading about Dr. Korean's life and being, being inspired by it. Growth and development are very different things. Economic growth is about the production and consumption of commodities. Social development is about improving people's living conditions and the quality of life. Ultimately, it is about freedom. Freedom from poverty, hunger, illness, insecurity, inequality, discrimination, authoritarianism, violence, and other miseries that ruin the quality of life. The difference between growth and development is obvious, but it tends to be forgotten in the frantic, frantic quest for faster, GDP growth. The obsession with GDP growth nowadays is such that the media watches quarterly growth estimates to the decimal point, when in fact these quarterly growth estimates don't have that much precision that you can make any difference between 6.7 and 7.2. But if it becomes 7.2, uh, the media says, oh, the, the economy is picking up and demonetization is behind us, and if it's 6.7, the media says the economy is in a tailspin, and uh, uh, this is all because of demonetization. This is all nonsense. There is no difference for practical purposes between 6.7 and 7.2 as far as quarterly growth estimates are concerned. But this uh, reflects the uh, fixation with, with economic growth, which incidentally, I feel, is rooted in the fact that the main objective of the policymakers is perhaps not so much poverty reduction, 
but enhancing the power and prestige of India in the world. If you want power and prestige in the world, yes, what you need is growth and not development. But if you're interested in improving people's living condition, then you should be interested in development. And of course, growth would still be useful because growth creates uh, tax revenue that can be used to provide public services. It also raises private incomes and both can contribute to better quality of life. But there's, there is much more to it, to, uh, there is much more to growth than development. If growth is our objective, then the market mechanism and profit seeking will serve our purpose to a large extent. But if our objective is social development, then there's also a major role for cooperation, non-profit activity, and public spiritedness of the kind that Dr. Korean incarnates. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking and inspiring oration. Dr. G. Brzee will now take questions from the audience. I'm from GMP student, uh, general management here. So my question is, so you have been critic of uh, M, uh, like using MG in Nareha, sorry, uh, you have been critic of using other digital system uh, into uh, for PDS public distribution system. Say like, uh, like at least two percentage or five percent even people would have, no, because of other, they were not able to use ration cards. So using the public distribution system has been affected because of other digital. So if not now, if I have, if sure, should, if the government should not implement the other now, and what is the period which government has to take steps? Because anyway, I feel that uh, down the line, two like two years also, there will be some percentage, five percentage of people like who were not access for digital, and that will affect the. Uh, so anyway, their lives will be always affected. So which way you think that uh, we can implement the digital and that uh, our public distribution system or the, even the basic benefits which they are getting is not at all affected. And the second question I have like, uh, you implement, like you were a backbone of, for engineering hub. Now, if I say like the healthcare system, you have been always critical of that for India. So for healthcare system, like MG Nareha, which uh, did something on employment, how do you think for healthcare system, do we think that some laws or already existing one has to be improved in such a way that it can reach all the poverty people? That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. The first question is about Ada and the PDS. Now, I could give you a long answer, but I'll try to be brief. So let's talk about Jharkhand. The PDS in Jharkhand used to be shot through with corruption. If you go back 10 years, maybe even five years, a huge amount of the grain used to be sold in the black market, and only a fraction was reaching the uh, people who were entitled to it. Over time, the situation actually improved uh, very substantially, largely taking inspiration from Chhattisgarh's success in reforming the PDS. So by 2016, the system had improved a great deal, and I feel that if the Chhattisgarh-inspired PDS reform had continued, then today we could have, in Jharkhand, a virtually corruption-free PDS. Instead of that, what was, what was done at that time was to impose Adar-based biometric authentication, what we call ABBA, Adar-based bi biometric authentication. And I think there's a lot of evidence now that this has created serious problems. And there, there are different layers of problems. I mean, one is that you may not have an Adar number. 
Uh, that is not a problem for a large number of people, but there are some, still some people in Jharkhand who don't have an Aadhaar number. More importantly, many people find it difficult to link their Russian card to Aadhaar. For example, they may not know that it's necessary, they may not be able to pay the bribe that is being uh, extracted from them, uh, they may have problems with internet connectivity and so on. And if you remember what the, Jark the, the method that the Jharkhand government used, not only in the PDS, but also in Narega and even in social security pensions for seeding other is what you can call the ultimatum approach. So you give people a deadline and you tell them that if you don't link your Aadhaar card, uh, your Aadhaar number with your Russian card or with your job card or with your pension by that date, then after that your pension will be cancelled or your Russian card will be cancelled. And indeed, last year, lakhs of Russian cards were cancelled after the deadline. Incidentally, the ultimatum approach does not work with the middle class, because the middle class has more power, so they tend to rebel. And that is why, to this day, uh, SIM cards and bank accounts have not yet been compulsorily linked with other, because every time the government tries to impose a deadline, the deadline gets postponed, because many people don't cooperate. Now that's with the middle class. But with the poor, the deadline is enforced, and that is how many Russian cars and job cars and pensions were cancelled, even though many of them belonged to people who were actually alive and eligible for these benefits. And the third problem, which is the most serious problem, is that even if you have linked your Russian card with Aadhaar, you have to pass the biometric test every month to get your food rations. It's not compulsory everywhere, but it's compulsory in about 80% of the Russian shops. And many people, even those who have been able to link their Russian cars with other, have found themselves unable to uh, buy their food rations because the biometric machine didn't recognize the fingerprints or because there was a connectivity problem and so on. You know, this is a very, very fragile technology in a place like Jharkhand where there are so many connectivity problems because ABBA depends both on internet connectivity and on biometrics. And that is the reason why in the last few months we have seen many people being deprived of their food rations. And in some cases, as you know, uh, people have also even ended up dying of hunger because there was just, there were no other resources in the house. They were entirely dependent on the PDS or on pensions for their survival. And suddenly they found themselves cut off and they had no other means of surviving. You must have all heard about the case of Santoshi Kumari in Simdega district, who died on 28th September last year. It's almost exactly uh, one year ago. Uh, because the family was entirely dependent on the PDS for its survival, and the Russian card was cancelled uh, because the family had failed to link it with Ada, uh, and so they found themselves deprived of food. Now, this is not to say that reforms are not required. Firstly, I think that the most important reform that Jharkhand still has to do in the PDS is to get rid of the private dealers, which Chhattisgarh has done and Orissa has done. In Chhattisgarh and Orissa, the private dealers were removed from the PDS and the licenses for the PDS were given to community institutions like Gram Panchayats, cooperatives, Mahila Samu, and those tend to be more accountable to local people that's one of the most important steps that can be taken to avoid corruption. And as far as authentication and identification is concerned, I think that at least in Jharkhand, smart cards would be a much better technology than other based biometric authentication because it doesn't require internet and it doesn't require biometrics and it can serve pretty much the same purpose as other. So in short, in a nutshell, that is why I am opposed to biometric authentication in the PDS and I feel that there are better alternatives. Uh, the question on healthcare again is a long question, but briefly, um, many countries in the world today have achieved not only rich countries, but a growing number of developing countries like Brazil, Mexico, Thailand, Sri Lanka, China, to a large extent Vietnam, countries that are not necessarily richer than India, have achieved what is called universal healthcare. Universal healthcare means that nobody is deprived of healthcare 
for want of resources. If you are ill, the society takes charge and ensures that you get adequate quality health care. Uh, that has been achieved in almost all the rich countries, for example, the OECD countries, with the notable exception of the United States. In the United States, there is still a substantial fraction of the population, perhaps 10% or so, which is deprived of health insurance and has no means of support uh, in the event of illness. But all the other OECD countries have a system of universal health care that covers everybody. So I think that in India, what is very important is to give serious thought to what could be a system of universal health care for India. Because there are different ways of doing it. It's not like there's a single way of doing it. In some countries, like England and Cuba that I mentioned in my talk, it is achieved essentially through public provision. Basically, healthcare is a public facility, you know, like a museum or the, the fire service. If your house catches fire, you call the fire service and they come to your house. They don't ask you, are you BPL, APL, are you rich or poor? Are you they come and they deal with the fire. So it's like that. In England, in Cuba, if you are ill, you go to a public hospital, you don't have to bring your wallet because it's free. Everything is free. Treatment, medicines, everything. That's one way of doing it. And then there are other countries, for example, like Canada, where it's not done mainly through public provision, it's done through social insurance, which means that everybody is part of a universal and compulsory single insurance, non-profit of course, insurance system. And then when you are ill, you can go to a facility of your choice, public facility or private facility, because there are many private facilities as well, but the cost is paid by the insurance. And then there are many countries where there is a mixture, for example in Thailand, of public provision and social insurance. So there are different ways of doing it. And what we need in India is an informed debate about how we can achieve and how soon we can achieve universal health care. Unfortunately, the central government, as it happens tomorrow, is going to launch a program of so-called universal health care called Ayushman Bharat, which is absolutely not universal health care. The total budget to cover 50 crore persons is, as of now, 2,000 crores, okay? 40 rupees per person. 40 rupees is the cost of a big tube of toothpaste. But this is, you know, this is what you're going to get from Ayushman Bharat. The average beneficiary is going to get 40 rupees of healthcare. And the fact that it's insurance, that doesn't help to multiply the money. It, it can lead to a better distribution of the health expenditure between different people. But it's still 40 rupees per person. So the budget is minuscule. I mean, it's nothing. It's a minuscule, bi microscopic addition to the existing health budget. So it's actually a kind of public relations exercise, and it's not, as of now, a serious proposition. Of course, over time, it may become a serious proposition if the government puts the money in it. Just to give you an idea of the kind of resources that, that are required, in this scheme, Ayushman Bharat, uh, the coverage is supposed to be 10 crore families, 50 crore people, and the coverage is up to five lakhs per person. Now, if people use 1% of their entitlement on average every year, 1%, then the cost would be 50,000 crores per year. And we are spending now 2,000 crores, out of which only 1,000 crores is additional because 1,000 crores is carried over from earlier schemes. And within that 2,000 crores, you are also supposed to create 150,000 so-called health and well-being centers. It just doesn't make any sense. I mean, the maths just doesn't add up. So, coming back to the main point, I think what we really need is not this kind of public relations exercise, but a serious debate and a serious initiative to move towards a real universal healthcare system. Thank you, sir.
Hello, sir. First of all, uh, thank you very much for your beautiful oration. Every bit of it was delightful, inspiring, and made tremendous sense. Uh, particularly impressive was the way you really elucidated the concept of the modes of social interaction, competition, coercion, and cooperation. How competition and coercion, capitalism and communism defined the last century and how it has not really created the perfect results it was supposed to. And uh, how you define how the 21st century must define cooperation as the underlying ideology. So the question is simple. How can we as individuals take some practical steps? How we as individuals